the work that I've done suggests this roller coaster crash. And uh, it is typical on a roller coaster that you go to the highest peak just before the greatest fall. Hi, everyone. I'm joined once again by Adam Taggart. And uh, Adam recently did a wonderful interview on his Wealthy On channel with David Hunter about uh, the what, what's going, what David Hunter sees in the future. And it's quite interesting because uh, you know I've talked about the roller coaster crash before that we are on this roller coaster crash where you've got the threat of deflation, you've got an inflation, and the markets go along with the inflations and deflations, and uh, and David Hunter believes there's going to be a huge melt-up followed by a huge crash. Adam, can you tell us about this interview? Because I found it quite fascinating. Uh, absolutely. So, yeah, I think roller coaster crash is a great term for it. I, I wouldn't be surprised if David steals that from you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so David is, um, you know, he's, he's one of the more fun folks that, that I interview on, on Wealthy on, and uh, definitely one of the most controversial because his calls both go against sort of conventional sentiment, and they tend to be very extreme. Um, one thing I will say is he is coming off a string of fairly prescient calls. So as, as bold as his forecasts are, you know, I, I wouldn't encourage anybody to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, dismiss them. So you're, you're very right, Mike. Mike uh, David expects, is calling for uh, an epic melt-up in the stock market from here, and then an epic crash all in this year, all in, in 2022. <clears throat> um, and uh, trying to give you sort of the, the condensed version of why, a uh, whole bunch of factors, um, but he largely believes that um, looking at the scope of history, uh, every bull market, every secular bull market ends in sort of a parabolic blow off top. And he doesn't believe that we've seen that yet and now sees the conditions in place for that to happen. And by a parabolic blow off top, um, as, as well as the stock market has performed, particularly over the past year and a half, he still sees it having like maybe like 35% upside from here. So S&P going from you know 4,500-ish to 6,000 in just the next three to five months. Um, a lot of people just can't imagine that happening. A lot of reasons go into that, including he thinks the Fed's going to reverse its, its hawkish policies at some point over that period. But again, it comes down to the fact that he believes that uh, you know uh, every, every bull market has that blow off top. And this 39-year secular bull market that we're in has been the biggest one ever and therefore should have the biggest blow off top ever. And then, of course, based on all the macro issues that you and I talk a lot about, Mike, he thinks the market then is going to have to you know, basically go through a, a corrective reckoning. And it's so overvalued right now, and there's so much fragility and instability in the system that he's think, he thinks that things will crash 70 to 80 percent. Um, now, you know, most people, again, can't wrap their brains around magnitudes of meltups like that or meltdowns like that in such a compressed period of time. Who knows if it's actually going to happen? But, you know, David puts forth a, you know, a lot of his reasoning for it. Folks should go listen to that. By the way, Mike, he's very favorable on how gold is going to perform during this period. Um, <clears throat> but most importantly, there is historical precedent for this, for, for, for corrections of, you know, blow ups and blow downs of that magnitude. In just a couple of minutes, we're going to get to some charts that you've pulled from, uh, from uh, 19, uh, the 1929 crash. Um, which basically walk people through that. Um, but very quickly, I want to get to a, um, uh, a the tweet of the day, um, which is basically a headline from uh, one of the most famous roller coaster crashes that we've had before, uh, which of course was the big uh, 1929 crash. And uh, this headline basically is from when, uh, I think it's from late October 1929, the market had just fallen 23%. And uh, everybody who never thought the market could drop that far that fast, came out and declared that it was over. But then what happened after that? Uh, well, I'm going to get to that in the charts. Uh, one of the things I do want to point people to is about a year ago, I did a video uh, comparing the 1929 stock market crash to today and showing the eerie similarities that happened throughout the late 20s and then all the way uh, you know, into 32. You know, To paraphrase, Winston Churchill, the further you look back into history, the further into fu the future you can see. And so, uh, you know, you really have to look at history, 
history. They say, I believe it was Mark Twain that said that history never repeats, but it often rhymes. Uh, and uh, I am fond of saying history always repeats, but with little twists. And those little twists are based on the underlying fundamentals of the situation. So if you look at the fundamentals of what was happening in the stock market, what was happening in the economy, what was happening with the government and Fed policy and so on back in the 20s and into the 30s, and, and you study different moments in history with what they're doing with the currency supply and so on, uh, as compared to what is happening right now, those little twists are going to make up the differences, the reason that history rhymes, but doesn't exactly repeat. It repeats with a twist. And uh, so uh, uh, I think we'll just move on to these charts here. Uh, the first chart that I've got is the blow-off top that you're talking about here. <clears throat> now, uh, we're talking about just a few months here. So from late May, May 27th, uh, you've got uh, June, July, August. So this is a, a, a little bit over three months uh, of data. And you're talking about going from, th this is like a, this is a, a quite an enormous rally from uh, 191 or 193, I believe it was, uh, up to 381. Uh, this is an amazing percentage gain. Now I'm going to back out a little and go to, to start this chart at 1928. So you can see that that blow off top, if you look at the low in May of 29, uh, that's what we're talking about. There was another big rally before that and, uh, uh, and then a consolidation. But uh, from, in, from late February of 28 to early September of 29, you're talking about a doubling. We went from 191 to 381. Uh, this is uh, enormous. And <clears throat> the euphoria that they had back then was very similar to the euphoria of the stock markets today. Then, you know, that's September 3rd uh, is that chart. The next chart is the 18th of October. And you can see that uh, there had been a pullback. This was not the crash yet. And it sort of developed a little head and shoulders pattern, which is interesting. And then over the next nine calendar days, now these are calendar days, nine calendar days could incorporate two weekends. So this is a maximum of seven trading days, but possibly as little as five trading days. It crashed all the way from that 333 points down to 230. Uh, this, <laughs> this was so blindingly fast. It's an enormous crash in a very, very short period of time. And then <clears throat> um, the day after that is when uh, the author, that was on the 29th, this headline of brokers believe the bottom is reached is on October 30th, the next day. And so the, the crash had stopped, there was a bounce, and, and that headline was written on October 30th. The next chart here is November 13th, but October 31st, the very next day, was where the Dow peaked and then rolled over again. So that prediction, that headline was true for 24 hours, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had a five-month rally after the, the, this temporary bottom of 198 was reached. Uh, so you've gone from uh, 380 uh, to 198, and then a rally up to 294. So, right. and, and Mike, just to chime in there, you know, so that, that headline came out and said, all right, folks, wow, you know, we didn't see this correction coming, but, but the bottom's in. It bounced for a little bit, then dropped again, you know, to a point where everybody said, okay, we were wrong the first time, but this is the bottom. Then they now have this pretty substantial rally by the end of which people are feeling like, all right, well, we're out of this thing and, you know, we're, we're, we're recovering our losses and looks like sailing is going to be good from here. Right. But then, uh, you know, it, it, anybody that did get in suffered some tremendous losses. And if your stocks pretty much averaged what the Dow, Dow Jones was, uh, it took about five months to uh, recover. 
And we did get back up in April of 1930 to a breath away from 300 here, uh, 294. But then take a look at what happened over the next couple of years. Uh, so look at April of 1930, and uh, you can see that, pay, that peak of uh, 294 in April of 1930. And the uh, next portion of the crash that brought it all the way down to 41.22 points. And now I want to, you know, in studying for my chapter on the Great Depression, this was many, many, many months of reading Milton, you know, the three main books that I focused on to write that. And I do want, you know, anybody that hasn't seen my uh, video on the crash of 29 compared to today, uh, really should go and watch that. And if you did watch it, but you only watched part of it, you should watch it to the end because it sort of gives you a preview of what could happen. You just need to know what all the fundamentals are. Uh, but uh, in that video, uh, you know, I show all of this and I show what was going on politically, what was going on in the markets, uh, that the, the books that I read to do that, the main books, I picked an Austrian econo economist, a Keynesian economist, and a monetarist. So you've got Milton Friedman, the monetarist, uh, Ben Bernanke, the Keynesian, and Murray Rothbard, the uh, Austrian. So America's Great Depression from Murray Rothbard, uh, Essays on the Great Depression by Ben Bernanke, and the history, monetary history of the United States from 1863 to 1960 by Milton Friedman and Anna Jacobson Schwartz. Um, and uh, all, well, with the exception of Ben Bernanke's book, all really good books. I've, I've said many <laughs> times, if you ever get a chance to read some Ben Bernanke, don't. <laughs> it's just going to make your head hurt. And it really does. I mean, you got to try and decode everything that he says. Uh, but I want to read you a quote from the economist John Kenneth Galbraith. Now, John Kenneth Galbraith was, all, Galbraith was also the economic advisor to, I believe, President Kennedy and Johnson. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, somebody's going to correct me on that, I'm sure. But, but anyway, uh, in his book about the Great Depression, uh, I ran across this paragraph and just had to take it as a quote. Almost everyone believed the speculation could now be resumed in earnest. So we're talking about that temporary bottom that came right after the crash and that newspaper article that you were talking about. Uh, a common feature of all of these earlier troubles was that having happened, they were over. The worst was reasonably recognized as such. The singular feature of the great crash of 1929 was that the worst continued to worsen. What looked one day like the end proved on the next day to have only been the beginning. Nothing could have been more ingeniously designed to maximize the suffering and also to ensure that as few as possible escaped the common misfortune. The man with the smart money who was safely outside of the market when the first crash came naturally went back in to pick up bargains. The bargains then suffered Ru a ruinous fall. John Kenneth Galbraith, Galbraith, the great crash. And so <clears throat> that's in the video. But the final chart that I want to show you here, after the Dow bottomed at 41.22 points, all of these charts that I showed you started in 1928. Stock charts, where I generated these charts, only has data going back to the year 1900. And there is no low lower than this 1932 low. It wiped out more than 30 years of gains. And, uh, you know, so I can't go back into the 1890s or the 1880s to find the gains that this completely wiped out. But it wiped out all the gains of the 20th century to date at the time. So, uh, <clears throat> This was a 90% crash, basically. It's 89 point something. And if you round it to the nearest number, it's 90%, um, the nearest whole number. Uh, I think David Hunter might be conservative because we're in a far bigger bubble by any measure. PE ratios, uh, you know, uh, 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 price, uh, that's price earnings. 
uh, price sales ratios, uh, the Buffett indicator. It doesn't matter what you pick to try and figure out is the stock market in a bubble or not. Uh, it's in the biggest bubble in history, which far exceeds, usually by multiples, uh, the peak in 1929. And the monetary system back then, even though it was so it poorly designed, we had what was called the gold exchange standard. Uh, the, gold, the classical gold standard ended with World War I, and we had this cobbled together, man-made, poorly designed uh, uh, monetary system that fell apart because of this crash but it had created the imbalances and the bubbles. Well, the system that we've got today does not use uh, something that ha that's in fixed supply as its foundation, such as gold, as we had, you know, they were cheating the gold standard with the gold exchange standard. The results, the, the uh, energy that was stored up came back to haunt them as this giant bubble and crash uh, a lot is the Federal Reserve is responsible for here. Uh, and today we have a system that's based on strictly voodoo. There's nothing there except the promise to tax us in the future. But the Federal Reserve with uh, you know just a couple of keystrokes can create a trillion dollars at any moment. Uh, nothing really backing it except the promise to tax us in the future. And, uh, and through open market op operations, they always go into the financial sector. Uh, you know, for a while here, we're seeing big inflation right now because they created currency to uh, send out checks to people during the pandemic here. But uh, and so that is the reason for the consumer inflation. But the market has been inflating for decades now, and the biggest inflation has come since 2008 where uh, Ben, you know, when, when this crash happens, it's the Bernanke bust is what's going to happen. Ben Bernanke caused all of this. Uh, Yellen and Powell just sort of carried on the tradition, but Ben Bernanke was the first one to start typing uh, trillions of dollars into existence and uh, pumping them into the financial sector. What is your take on all that? Uh, well, first, I just want to say, Mike, you did just a wonderful job walking through all that. So thank you. Um, it was actually really fun to watch, even though I'd seen the charts uh, in preparation of this video. Um, and real quick, folks, uh, if you enjoy this type of work, please don't forget to like this channel uh, and click the subscribe button below as well. Um, you know, hearing you go through all that, Mike, a um, couple of things came into my mind. One was um, building off of your comment about history rhyming. Uh, there's the old quote too that those that do not study history are condemned to repeat it right and i think that that's the danger that we face at this stage is so many people just don't think anything like this could happen again uh, and that's really where david hunter you know zeroes in in his work he is a contrarian investor um, and his you know major sort of investing lens is trying to find the things that people don't think could ever happen that actually have a good probability of happening and for all the reasons you just mentioned here, you know, there's enough, more than enough fragility in the system to have, you know, another type of corrective event like this. And it's it's amazing when you look at, you know, this this chart you put up from, uh, you know, 1900 to the, the mid 30s, um, you know, that folks is an elevator to hell <laughs> you know, that, when the market just completely melts away like that. And uh, uh, um, Bill Fleckenstein, who I was interviewing the other day, you know, he said asset price bubbles, asset price inflation is more dangerous than just, um, you know, goods and services price inflation because it creates so much malinvestment that when it pops, that pop is so destructive. And you can just see, you know, visually what that destructive potential is here. I mean, it's a, it's a vaporization of 90% of the wealth that's out there. And as your Galbraith quote, quote said, you know, um, not only did it destroy the people that were in the market, but it destroyed many of the people who were out of the market because they were playing by the old rules. Okay, when this market drops, I just got to, it's the 1920s version of buy the dip, right? I just got to come in and pick up these, these now you know, clear bargains because the market's corrected by 20%, by 40%, by 60%. And yet they continued to get wiped out as this vortex just drove everything lower. 
So look, I don't know if David Hunter is going to be proven right on the timeline that he's saying uh, is, this is all going to happen, but I don't think you can discount that to zero. And um, you've got to you know, at least open your mind to the possibility that if we see something similar to what we saw back then, you got to be very, very careful um, about how to, you know, what interaction at all you want to have with that correcting market. Um, and you really want to be prioritizing both risk management and, and capital preservation and, and really finding ways to park your money in things that are not going to lose their purchasing power. Of course, we talk a lot about gold on this channel, um, but that's a huge reason why gold makes a lot of sense right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, one of the things I want to say about uh, David Hunter's video, it was great, by the way, uh, but uh, the whether or not the melt up comes, and I do think he's right, because these things always end with some sort of blow off top. And, and we're just not seeing that right now. We're sort of a, seeing a continuation. You know, maybe it gets... Uh, we 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 could go down from here, but I, I doubt it. I think he's probably right. But when this crash happens, uh, the Fed is now, they've painted themselves into a corner where there is no good way out. If they tighten, there's a crash. If they don't tighten, you know, they, they put off tightening, right? And so now the markets can party. Uh, so maybe this blow off top is inevitable. But when the crash comes, how are they going to try and stop it? They're going to try and stop it by typing up trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars and, and trying to uh, get the markets to rise again. They're going to try to stop the economy from falling apart. Well, that causes loss in faith of the currency. And so I believe that this time, we, you, know, you got to remember too, like if you look at the Dow gold ratio, uh, the Dow was moving, gold was fixed. It was $20.67 an ounce. This time, they're both moving. Uh, and uh, so uh, this time, I think the crash could actually be more vicious. I think it could be more of this 90% crash instead of the 70 80% crash that David Hunter was talking about because it could be accompanied with a currency crisis. And that causes gold to go to the moon. And uh, in 1932, when the Dow was at, uh, 41.22 points. Basically, the Dow gold ratio was at two. Two ounces of gold bought the Dow, $20.67 an ounce uh, uh, times two was just slightly above uh, the, the uh, points on the Dow. Um, and we saw it go to one in 1980. And I've been saying that we could see it go to 0. 0.5. In other words, gold being twice whatever the Dow is. It doesn't matter what that figure is. This is your true gains because this is gains in value, not price. The price doesn't matter. If they inflate the currency supply and gold goes to a million bucks, but a cup of coffee is two million, that means gold fell <laughs> while it was going to two million to a million. So uh, anyway, um, yeah, uh, I, I think it was a, an amazing video. Congratulations on that. The work that I've done suggests this roller coaster crash, and uh, it is typical on a roller coaster that you go to the highest peak just before the greatest fall. Agreed, and, and I love that term, roller coaster crash. And, and just for completion, two things about Hunter's outlook with gold. One, he looks at gold and silver, and the miners is doing particularly well um, during this meltup. So his current targets are uh, by sort of you know. The, the end of the melt-up, he sees gold going to 2,500, silver going to 50, right? So that's a, more than a double for silver right now. And he sees the miners as more than doubling as well. Um, he also, just as you said, Mike, he does expect the Fed and the other central banks to come out with just gargantuan amounts of, of stimulus, uh, you know, in the depths of this crash, trying to reverse it. And so he sees the future after the crash has happened as being a persistently highly inflationary one and thinks gold, silver, other commodities and hard assets will do well in that environment too. So right. just, just, just for completion set there. Um, anything else, feel free to anything else you want, but I want to make sure we get to your uh, uh, quote of the day here because you have an yeah. excellent quote that kind of goes well with what we've been talking about. Okay. But what David Hunter is saying is that uh, the end of the gold will do well during this melt up, but the end of the melt up is simply the launch pad. <laughs> I mean, this isn't even like getting to the second stage yet. That's the launch exactly. pad for the rocket 
of precious metals. Okay, so quote of the day. When the whole world is running towards a cliff, he who is running in the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. C.S. Lewis. <laughs> and that is perfect for this video. I want to thank you so much, Adam, for uh, joining me. And everybody should go and visit Wealthion uh, and watch that David Hunter interview. Uh, thank you very much. We'll see everybody next time. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Mike. Always a joy.